Okay, good morning. Uh, this is Ben Windsor speaking for, for the Be Bold History Network. Uh, this is the first time I've stepped out from behind my Twitter pseudonym, uh, Mr. Classics 3. Uh, I'm joined this morning by Steve Mastin. Steve. Morning, Ben. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, how are you doing today? Are you well? Yeah, I am. I'm very well. The weather's getting better, so this lockdown is starting to feel a little bit like the first lockdown when the weather was so good. Yeah, indeed. There's a light at the end of the tunnel now. I think we're all a little bit bored by the idea of like being able to actually get outside and not have to put on 16 layers dressed up for an Arctic tundra. That would be quite pleasant. Um, so I don't know. There's something about the sunshine that always gives you that sense of mild euphoria, isn't there? Yeah, definitely makes a big difference. Okay, so we're going to um, speak this morning a little bit about classics in generally in terms of like secondary school curricula. Now there is, uh, you, there's a lot of stuff going around Twitter lately and you get people in academia saying things like, oh, the state of the discipline, we're kind of diminishing in state schools and whatever. But from my perspective, I kind of see it quite a lot differently. I'm seeing sort of a resurgence in the interest in classical subjects. And it's certainly something that I see from my students. I think we're making good ground in terms of teaching Latin in secondary schools. Um, so there's like the, the classics, uh, Cambridge Classics Schools Project, which is gaining ground there, and loads of interesting resources like Subarani as well, which I've been using a fantastic course that allows you to sort of peer behind the curtain of ancient Rome and see what life is like for the normal working schmoes um, rather than the elites. And, and so what I want to focus on this morning is kind of from your perspective, um, Kind of what that looks like but first of all we want to we want to get to know the man steve mastin and so design a few questions to begin with uh, to kind of get a sense of of kind of your personal journey steve as a classicist because we all have our own specific classic journeys i find and so we want to know a little bit more about yours first of all um so i've already spoken for quite a long time i do apologize let's let's kick off with our first question a nice sort of um sort of background question about you, Steve. So first of all, what we want to know is what is it that first in, uh, sparked your interest in the classics? Uh, I think for, for everyone, there's something from childhood um, uh, that sparks their interest in, in classics. So I've been a teacher now for over 20 years um, in state schools. And uh, for 17 years, I was a head of history and introduced ancient history uh, into um, the school. At Key Stage 3 as well, introduced some classics into the early stages of Year 7, and then went to work for a multi-academy trust for a couple of years across 14 schools. And that's where I was working specifically in primary schools and looking at the introduction of ancient history, classical civilizations into primaries. And now I'm a, a consultant, so I go into secondaries and primaries, and I'm doing a lot of work at the moment in, in Haringey with uh, introducing ancient history into um, around 100 schools so far in North London, which is really encouraging. But Amazing work, well done. Yeah, well, um, all fun. I mean, you get you get paid to do something you love, so that's even better, isn't it? You never um, work a day of your life, do you, if you, if you do something you love? It's not the old phrase, isn't it? It's the best. It is the best. Um, I, I think what first sparked my interest, Ben, was probably in year two or year three at primary school, I remember my teacher talking about the Greek derivation of some words that we used in English. And that just sparked my, my interest. So looking at a word like geography or biology or astronomy and realizing that a lot of the words that, that we were using, and I was fascinated anyway by, by learning new words, but that these words had ancient origins. And for some reason, I got terribly excited about that. But I got even more excited when my teacher, I'm sure it was year three, started to tell us stories of Greek mythology. And she always began a lesson with a story from Greek mythology, or rather began the day. So we would have um, time, I think, sitting in a circle. So it was all very primary schoolish. Mm -hmm. And I remember once she told us the story of Echo and that the king of the gods, Zeus, had become enamored 
with Echo, as Zeus often became enamored with uh, all sorts of all sorts of ladies um, and men. Keep it in his toga, could he? Um, he really couldn't. No, um, I'm not sure Zeus wore a toga. I think we're mixing up our Greek and, and Roman there. But yeah. I'll, I'll let you off the hook then. Um, and not all of the stories are suitable for primary school uh, if we're telling them in their entirety. But I do remember having my attention grabbed by the idea that in a fit of jealousy, Zeus's wife Hera cursed Echo, the nymph Echo, to speak only the last words that were spoken to her. So it wasn't just the derivation of geo and graphos or telephonos, telephone, etc., etc. It was also that, that stories from Greek and Roman mythology, stories from a long time ago, had become part of our everyday language and that most people didn't know this. And then, of course, you come to words like atlas or phobia or chronology or cloth or music, and they all have their origins in the classics. So that first sparked my, my interest. I should also say that um, I went to school in Australia. And uh, in, in history lessons in Australia, you also learn some indigenous history. And my parents had a, a, a very good friend, an indigenous um, friend, and he was also a voracious reader of Greek and Roman history. So I used to have conversations with him about the Greeks and the Romans, but then in the course of talking with him about ancient history, of course, his history was even older. So we're talking going back 40, 45,000 years. But that, at the time, it didn't really occur to me, and it's since occurred to me in later years when I've grown up and started to read more about the classical world, but also the Western approach to history, and also the indigenous approach to history. So I used to have conversations with him about what indigenous Australians call the dream time, and these stories of their past and their origins. And, and I must say, at the time, I just pushed it to one side as if it was oral history, it was oral tradition, and therefore it was more in the realms of folklore or legend. And I really didn't think much more to it until I came back to it many years later and started investigating the way that indigenous Australians see their history. I mean, there are limits to ancient memories, but then when you study something like Livy, and this is bringing back the connection to classics, if you think of Livy's history of Rome, um, the most uh, often uh, the way we think about it is we look at the sources that Livy used. Now that's very much in the Western historical tradition. So we look at Calpurnius Piso or Fabius Picta, and we think, so where did L Livy get these stories? What were his sources? And we use words like sources and evidence. But if you just think of that story of Romulus and Remus, and we would usually dismiss it as legend. So there is mm. no evidence. Um, there is no archeological evidence for the origins of Romulus and Remus. However, when you start digging into the story, the um, picture that you can see there, which uh, of course Romulus and Remus down at the bottom of this, uh, it's an altarpiece that was found at Ostia, the port of Rome. And the traditional story of Romulus and Remus with the wolf, but then Livy makes this, this little aside in the story where he says that the word for prostitute was lupa, which was a she-wolf. So this nickname for a prostitute, Lupa. So were the two boys found by a Lupa prostitute or a Lupa, a wolf? And of course, that little simple aside makes you think actually in, in, in legends or folklore, there is often an element of truth. There is something that happened there. After all, the name Rome had to come from somewhere. And so the story starts to have a little bit more resonance. And so in the same way that I would think about the way that indigenous Australians told their stories, and I learned some of their stories when I was at primary school in Australia, likewise, I'm convinced that in the classics, too much we dismiss because we're very much part of that Western historical tradition. That's a very long That's answer to your question, Ben. No, I, I love it. And it actually echoes something I was speaking about with my ancient historians not long ago. Um, and, the, and the thing is, as you said, the history like this is that a lot of it can be passed on orally. And so how much of that do we get of like a Chinese whispers effect where someone perhaps reports a piece of information a little bit inaccurately to begin with? And then that get passed down the chain and each time it changes 
and morphs into something different each time. And so we were talking about the dual possibility of the prostitutes uh, she wolf connection and, and how far and which one, first of all, is the more likely. But secondly, which one is probably the, the more likely to have shaped Rome's image of itself? And of course, it is the more mythological, legendary interpretation of that. And uh, we had a lot of fun with it as well, because what, what we realized quite quickly is that there are actually quite a few parallels between the Romulus uh, and Remus story and, and an older uh, tradition of Cyrus the Great growing up in Persia. For instance, they both have sort of a, this pastoral upbringing, this rags to riches sort of upbringing. Um, and uh, they, they both become known by their kind of older relatives who had tried to have them cast out. There's an advisor or a messenger on both ones where they're tasked with killing the child, but never quite do it. And so we reach another sort of conclusion there where not only could it be an obfuscation of already existing myths from their own cultures, but also they could be impacted upon by myths from other cultures as well. But it's this incredible mixing pot where it actually becomes more of a work of disentangling where each aspect comes from. And you can often trace it back to another part of the globe as well. It shows how interconnected um, things actually are in the ancient world, which is great because we tend to assume, and I certainly did when I was younger, that each of these sort of episodes happen in isolation from each other. But in reality, with no hard borders in the ancient world, the, the possibility for mixing of cultures and legends like that is, is far more integrated than we initially give it credit for. Um, and just one of the many fascinations I have with the ancient world as well. Yeah, I, that's interesting that you, you pick up on these stories that are interconnected. I think, um, I think going back to your point about Chinese whispers, I think there's something about the Western historical tradition that looks down its nose slightly at oral tradition. And I think if you go to ancient civilizations like the Indus Valley um, in Asia, or if you go to, as I was saying, indigenous Australians, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of how oral history actually works in certain human societies. So I'm pushing the Western tradition to one side here um, so history is not kept by children playing games. Um, history is kept in these societies by specialists, by story specialists. So in the indigenous Australian culture, if you are the keeper of history in a society that doesn't have a written language, and that's the key one. We always go back to Herodotus, don't we? The father of history. But of course, what Herodotus is doing is very different from what indigenous cultures are doing like Native Americans or indigenous Australians. Because your job, if you are a history keeper, your job is to preserve that story verbatim. It's not like when I sat on my grandmother's lap and she would tell me a story to get me to bed at night. It's not in the same, it's not in the same category. You have to be an apprentice, you train for many years and you go through tests and approval processes before you're deemed qualified to serve as a keeper of these stories. So when I compare it going back to Livy um, or, or Plutarch or these, these great writers that we think of in the Western tradition, I think sometimes we push oral tradition too quickly to one side when actually, as we were talking there about the story of Romulus and Remus, that actually it goes back to a Greek story that predates Romulus and Remus. Or you go back to the Trojan Wars even before that and you think that there must be something to this. There must be something to this. Yeah, but that's yeah. And it seems to be the sort of recurrence of of um, various different themes, and it kind of uh, indicates the the sort of concerns and tensions of the people who are around at the time. And these themes often crop up in the stories that they tell. And what what I find quite interesting is that what we actually end up with, aside from the literature and the myths and the stories handed down, is we actually get an interesting insight into human psychology through some of these stories and the kind of concerns and tensions that they had around at the time. Um, which I find super fascinating as well. Um, that's, wow, we really got into it. That was a thoroughly good discussion there, Steve. Let's uh, move on to the, to the next point. Um, speaking about the, the classics and sort of things that interest us about them, I myself, I've got, I've got a sort of a long line of people who kind of sparked that interest and nurtured it and fostered it and helped it to grow. Did you have any people like that? I, I mean, you spoke, you spoke about your primary teacher and, and your um, Aboriginal friend as well. Are there any other people who kind of helped facilitate your interest in the classics as you were growing up or even as an adult? It always comes back to a teacher. Um, 
always, I think, in everyone's story. And uh, for me, it was when I was at secondary school and I started to study ancient history and classics. And that was my, uh, my teacher called Mr. Wilkinson. And Mr. Wilkinson, uh, I might look back now as a teacher who has trained teachers myself and think he just winged it far too often, far too often. But he was one of those teachers who could hold you in the palm of his hand for one hour and the clock flew by mm. and, you, and you left knowing a huge amount. Now, I, I wouldn't hold him up. Uh, I mean, bless him, bless his sainted memory from my, from my perspective. Um, I wouldn't hold him up as a model of what I would consider uh, great reflective teaching and interaction with, with the class. However, um, what he could do was tell an amazing story and he would tell it in ways that made the story memorable. And I think that's something that, that not all teachers have naturally. Some do, some have it instinctively, but that idea of choosing which words you will repeat and choosing where to pause, where the moments of tension are, the moments of drama, where you, uh, where you herald something. So children are waiting for the thing to happen because you've heralded it several times in a very careful way. And he was very good at that. So I remember studying the Epic of Gilgamesh with him. And um, I was brought up in, uh, in quite a religious uh, home. And so the, the flood story, um, Noah's flood, was something I was very familiar with. And of course, I, could, I can see you smiling and nodding there. Um, then, of course, when you come to the Epic of Gilgamesh and you realize that flood narratives are quite common in the ancient world. And the oldest recorded story that we have, uh, written story, is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And that blew my mind that I was reading something that was older than the texts in the Bible, and it was a flood narrative. But even that word epic, this idea of the telling of stories, of, of long stories of, of heroes, of demons, of monsters, of great deeds, of, of great adventures. Uh, but then you look at other, other civilizations. I remember um, speaking with him about the, the Iliad and the Aeneid. Uh, of course, the Aeneid is a much later epic, but Virgil is still in that tradition, uh, or wanting to be in that tradition of writing epics. So when we look at things like the, the Ramayana um, in, in the Hindu uh, tradition, again, another epic of great deeds of, of, of great people, of people to admire, people to emulate, people not to admire and not to emulate for different reasons. And these, these traditions, um, Mr. Wilkinson was just very good at telling the story where he hooked you in and you just wanted to know more and more and more. Yeah, and it comes back again to the, again, the ancient art of storytelling. And I, I found that also with my teachers is that they were excellent storytellers. And again, like your Mr. Wilkinson, I had a, a teacher at secondary school who, who, who walked in and we were doing our AS level uh, Latin and we were, we were looking at the Aeneids, the final battle scene between Aeneas and, and Turnus. And and it was again, he, it wasn't planned. He just came and did it on the fly. But I was enraptured by it, and it's just kind of the strength of the narrative that these things give us, which in, gives it its inherent value. I find with the classics, because you can just get lost in a story like that, and that in part is pretty much what hooks me in to begin with. Um, so the, the, just the strength of its narrative is kind of one of its key features, why I think it's so valuable and why we all need to have a look at it at some point, even if we don't study it to GCSE or take it any further. Um, I believe that everyone could should sort of be entitled to it. Um, okay, so... Uh, I think what Milton Wilkinson was able to do, because he was a subject specialist, was just open that, that world even further up. Um, my teacher in primary school, uh, Mrs. Page, who used to start every lesson uh, or every day with a story, a story from the ancient world that, that hooked my interest. Um, of course, primary school teachers have to be Leonardo da Vinci's. They have to be good at everything and teach everything. Whereas, of course, when I got to secondary school, all that wonderful incubation of Mrs. Page's stories suddenly opened up to something um, that just blossomed and my love for the ancient world has has never dimmed yeah so it's uh, so, so she worked really hard on like sort of build do that bit of world building early on in life and once you you get the ability to look at other stuff it kind of opens out into this whole world narrative and 
Yeah, fantastic. I, it's the same with me. I mean, I, mine started with my father used to read me Odyssey when as a bedtime story, and like that—that that was it. Just straight away, I was done. It's like, right, well, I want to know a little bit more about Cyclopses tomorrow, Dad. Can you find me some information on it? Can we talk about Cyclopses? And and that basically gave me the inroad into all the mythical creatures, which as a kid, I mean, that was my version of dinosaurs. Um, because pretty much everyone will have a dinosaur fixation, but that one was mine. It was the myths and the, and the monsters. So uh, what would you say, Steve, as a, um, today, what would you say is your favourite part of the classics uh, in terms of it, literature, archaeology, art? Is there something today that really kind of brings your attention and brings you back every time, would you say? Uh, I, I think it's impossible to narrow it down to, to one thing. I mean, my, my favorite building in, in the world has to be the Parthenon. Uh, with a close second of the Pantheon in Rome. But literature, uh, I remember, I remember studying Alexander, uh, Plutarch's life of Alexander. And then teaching it many years later to my own students. So when I was studying Alexander with Mr. Wilkinson, uh, it was quite a traditional way of, of teaching it, but because he was such a good storyteller, the stories came alive and I was fascinated, by, and I have always been fascinated by, by Alexander of Macedon. Um, however, it was when I started teaching Alexander myself in secondary school, uh, and this was the OCR ancient history course, and there was a, a unit on Alexander. And it, it enabled you to have conversations in class, legitimate conversations that would be difficult to have or would be very strange to have in any other context. I'll give you some examples. The wonderful thing about teaching the classics is that you can have very open honest conversations about things like religion, which if you were to do that in a religious studies class, it could become quite personal because you're studying world religions that are still um, adhered to by very devout people. But when you're looking at the ancient world and you're looking at when Alexander gets to Persia and the Persians perform this proskinesis, this obeisance, because their idea of their king, their king of kings, Darius, was that he was a living God. And so they treated him as a living God. So when Alexander conquers the king of kings, of course, he gets to Babylon and the Babylonians think, well, you must be even greater than Darius. So they naturally perform this obeisance. And Alexander's Greek men look at this and, and laugh out loud, um, according to Plutarch. It's just so bizarre to them that you would treat a human now, of course, you could get into a conversation about Christianity and Christianity's understanding as Jesus as being the incarnate son of God and what that means. Now, that becomes very personal. But actually, in the context of Persia and Greece, you can have a very honest conversation about religion. You can also have very honest conversations about uh, sexuality. And you can have honest conversations about gender roles and about women and about slavery. So some of these words that I've just mentioned now are, are very much within the zeitgeist of big conversations that the history community is rightly wrestling with. But actually in the ancient world and in the study of the classics, these are conversations that teachers have been having for decades in the class. So one little example, if you think of the treatment of women in the ancient world, when Alexander um, wins the Battle of Issus, and Darius flees the battlefield. He leaves behind his wife and his daughters and all his loot. Now, it would have been perfectly reasonable in the ancient world for Alexander and his men to have raped the women as trophies of war. Now, of course, to have that conversation in a classroom in, in, in today's world is quite uh, is quite jarring and is understandably very uh, challenging to have. But of course, Alexander doesn't do that. So here is someone in the fourth century who treats Darius's wife and his daughters as if they are his own family. Now, the rationale for that, we can speculate because Alexander was quite respecting 
of other cultures. And that's also an, a very fascinating conversation to have about the extent to which Alexander stands out. I mean, you can see I'm kind of going off on one here. He is a bit of a, a hero. But then I remember a conversation with a pupil once. Um, it was in a, in a lesson about Alexander, but just before we got to Alexander. So we were looking at his father, Philip of Macedon, and his, uh, his assassination by his bodyguard, uh, Pausanias. Now, of course, Philip's bodyguard was also uh, Philip's lover. And the occasion was Philip's seventh wedding. Now you can see the the year. Touching Eurydice, wasn't it? It was indeed Eurydice, and you can see the year ten's minds clicking over, trying to put all of these pieces into place, thinking this doesn't compute. Well, isn't that fascinating? That living in a twenty-first century classroom, and they think they're quite liberal about attitudes towards sexuality, but of course, the words that we have today, like. Um, homosexuality or same-sex relationships or even homophobia, it would be very difficult to try and impose these words on the fourth century BC because they didn't have the same concept, the same categories that we have. So it actually makes you quite respectful of other cultures. And this one pupil, when he said, so Philip was a king, he had conquered Greece effectively uh, with the League, um, he had seven wives, and he was assassinated by his male lover. Um, yeah, that's correct. And he couldn't understand. And I thought, well, well, without going into it too much yet, then basically, in the world in which Philip was living, it was all to do with your social status. So uh, the, 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 the part that you took in the act of intercourse de was determined by your social status. I said, let's just leave it there. Um, otherwise, <laughs> letters from parents. And this boy turned to the girl next to him and he said, I didn't think when I signed up for ancient history that I would get gay sex first thing on a Wednesday morning. And I thought, isn't that, isn't that, isn't that interesting that, you know, in, in which context can you have quite an open and honest conversation about women's roles, about culture, about sexuality, about religion? And it's all very open and very honest and, and also faithful to the text that we're reading. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, I think it's the, the same as you said, because there's so much time dividing us in the modern day with the events that happened those thousands of years ago, the, the, the space in between those events and us allows us this kind of thinking room without providing that sort of, without provoking that sort of knee jerk emotional reaction that you might get from analyzing modern events. We've got that sort of historical distance to kind of get a little bit more perspective. For example, my OCR ancient history students, they're fascinated by the fact that Alexander and Hephaestion's relationship will often be whitewashed in the media. They will say things like his good friend Hephaestion, whereas Aristotle is quoted as saying that they were one soul that inhabited two bodies. Uh, and so there is the difference there between, um, and also there is another thing that even back then you wouldn't, they wouldn't even classify it as a homosexual relationship as such. They would say that these two people were potentially in love with one another, but they would never give it the label that even tolerant people now would give to that relationship. Um, and so, yeah, it just gives us that space to have loads of discussions. And, and also the idea of, uh, you touched on it earlier, the policy of fusion uh, between the Macedonians and the Persians, that gives us some space to talk about, well, to what extent can two societies integrate peacefully um, and kind of combine their cultures and, and preserve their individual cultures, but coexist, which is still pertinent to modern day, given the political landscape of, of kind of the term, this current century and all that sort of stuff. So again, another reason why the classics should kind of be, be offered across the board. But amazing. I, um, I love the Alexander unit like you. Uh, I find it fascinating. Um, I wouldn't say he's a hero. I have a slightly different opinion. I agree that he's a great man. But as we read through the literature, we, we also have quite a lot of fun figuring out just in which ways that Alexander is flawed as well and how far Arun and Plutarch speak about him with this degree of hero worship. Um, which I think, given the modern day, my students, you know, the, the advent of social media, they are quite tuned into, OK, well, this is the way that they're presented, but this is the reality. Um, and so we like to do that balancing act of, OK, well, great man narrative over here, normal guy who has um, quite a lot of flaws over here. Um, and we love doing those sorts of discussions. So and, and again, it gives us the idea of creating balance and never just going on one side of the argument.
there's uh, evidence for both. So yeah, I, lo I love it. I love the Alexander unit, love the Persia unit as well. We teach OCR history uh, at my um, OCR ancient history at my school. So we get the we get the um, foundations of Rome unit. Um, so we get the Roman kings all the way up to first and second secession and stuff. So people power again, the idea of democracy gives us a great discussion space there. Um, the Alexander unit, we do Persia and a bit of Cleopatra as well, which brings in that whole feministic as aspect. Um, which we absolutely adore. Fantastic. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's great stuff. Um, so what do you think, in your opinion, as someone who's had so much experience as you and in, in bringing classics to schools and perhaps giving it to people who might not necessarily receive it usually, what, what do you think classics has in terms of what it can add to uh, people's lives? What is that thing that it gives us, that, the reason why we should do it? I think what classics gives is an awareness of being part of something much, much bigger. Now, of course, history teachers would do that. And when I was working as a head of history, most of the people in my history department, um, all crackingly good teachers, um, were fairly modern in their history when it comes to the ancient world. So uh, history teachers get a bit twitchy about medieval sometimes. Well, medievalists get incredibly twitchy about anything BC. So I think to have that perspective of thousands of years gives a student something that is, is quite difficult to teach uh, as if you're teaching it from scratch. And I'll give you an example. Um, can I show my, my next image? Of course, yeah. Which is the, the Meroe head, the famous Meroe head of Augustus. When um, some of the events of the last year were taking place, uh, so in the United States, there were statues of uh, Confederate generals that were being questioned. And of course, in Bristol, the, the removal of uh, Colston statue. Now, of course, to an ancient historian, there were resonances with all of that. Nothing that human beings do is ever new. It's all been done before. And I think that's what the classics gives you, is you can, you can look at, say, the, the pulling down or the debate about Confederate statues, and you can link that to the idea, well, the Romans were doing similar things because those Confederate general statues were not put up the year after the Civil War to commemorate their great victories. They were put up as signs of conquest in the 20th century in order to keep black Americans in their place. They were signs of dominance. And that's why their existence now is being questioned in parts of the United States. But then you look at the Meroe head. The Meroe head was put up by the Romans, a huge, huge statue of the Emperor Augustus in the province of Egypt. So this province many miles away from the epicenter of this great empire. And yet when the uh, Meroe raiders during the reign of Augustus came to this statue in the province of Egypt, not only did they destroy the statue and decapitate the head of Augustus, but they buried it outside Meroe under the steps of a temple. So literally you would have to walk over the head of Augustus in order to get into the temple. It was hugely symbolic. So when those events were taking place, I had this resonance that went back not to the 20th century or to the 19th, it goes back many, many centuries. And I think that's something that classics gives you. It gives you this much deeper, much longer perspective on where human beings have come from, the debates that have already been had. So everything that we're talking about now in our Western civilization has already been talked about by the ancients. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. There's, there's always a precedent for human behavior. And, and that's something that we seem to forget throughout time is that if, even if we go back a couple of thousand years, we're still talking about Homo sapiens, you know, human people in the same configuration as you and I today, who, who uh, perhaps thought about things slightly different due to um, cultural impacts and stuff, but basically reacted in similar ways to the way we react now. 
And so to think that us now and us them are hugely different in, in many different ways. In some ways, I suppose you'd be correct. But ultimately, it really comes down to the similarities between us now and those ancients back then. And there's always a precedent for stuff going on now uh, in the classics. And I, again, another key reason perhaps to why we should be teaching this stuff in uh, schools as well. Um, so on the subject of, of um, secondary school curricula and classics and your extensive history as head of department, educational consultant and all that sort of thing, we discussed at length about the benefits of, of classical subjects, uh, ancient history and Latin. But in your experience, what are the biggest barriers uh, for people getting these, these subjects onto the curricula? What, what kind of hints and tips might you give those people to kind of make a bit of progress? I think the biggest barrier then is, is unfamiliarity and a lack of confidence, um, which is surprising because history teachers, and I think it is history teachers generally who introduce classical history into secondary schools. Um, history teachers are very good, very adept at teaching new things. So for example, um, there is a, a very good GCSE unit now on uh, empire and migration. And it, it's been very well put together by history teachers. It's enthusiastically taught. But I would say three or four years ago, that was not uh, one of the main options at GCSE. But history teachers have looked at it, have thought, I can teach this. It's really important that we teach this. And they've embraced it and ran with it. And it's being taught well. But of course, there's almost that sense, like I said, twitchy things about anything BC, as if this is, this, is, this is almost not history, it's quite strange. And it's simply just that familiarity. The idea of that the teacher has to be an expert. And in, in secondary schools, you definitely have specialists in Tudor history or Russian history or medieval history, absolutely. And, and, and not so often do you have specialists in, in ancient history. And I think it, it goes back to the way in which ancient history is often taught to um, people like you and me. I think if you go to primary school and your, your experience of ancient history is, is quite a, a low level one, and there are some fantastic things happening in primary schools with ancient history, but if your experience of it is simply um, wrapping up something in toilet paper as an example of mummification. And so that's ancient Egypt. And then we do something on the ancient Romans and that was uh, looking at their diet and eating dormice or something like that. And then you move on uh, and you do something on, I don't know, the Greeks and you build a temple um, and then you're into secondary school and you never study ancient history again. So for me, there are two problems. The first one is that unfamiliarity with it as if it is this strange period rather than it's just another period of history that can easily be learned and taught, and it is so exciting. Also a very safe place to discuss some of the things that we've been talking about, like gender, religion, sexuality. But also um, it's people's own experience of ancient history, and it's seen as sometimes quite low level, quite basic, quite easy, because that's what we did in primary school. Um, there's a project that um, I'm involved in, as mentioned, in, in um, parts of North London. And I'll just give you a couple of examples, Ben, where these, this is year three, where year threes are obviously doing um, ancient Egypt. This is one of the books that we wrote and that they're reading. And then they move on to Cradles of Civilization, where they look at the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is year three. The Indus Valley. So we're moving from Africa to Asia now. Big depth study of Persia and Greece. And then they're moving on to ancient Greece, Alexander, and then on to Rome. So before they get anywhere near Roman emperors and gladiators and things like that, they are saturated with a secure knowledge of the ancient world. The second thing I, I would say, um, that unfamiliarity and, and, and also the, the idea that it goes back to primary school and maybe it's a little bit easy, is, is to say, where do you go for support? So I've moved the slide on to um, one area where, as you know, um, advocating classics education is just doing a phenomenal job and provides a huge amount of support for schools who do want to introduce 
classical civilizations or ancient history into their classrooms. And as well as advoca advocating classics education, um, there is also the classics for all. Um, the amount of training that they're willing to give to teachers, support, and also financial support, the idea that well, where would we get the money from to do this? Contact Classics for All and contact ACE because they will definitely help you. Um, they will not let you flounder. And particularly if you're in a history department that would love to offer something ancient, but you just don't know where to start, go to these places. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. And um, so if if someone has been watching this, uh, this sort of discussion between you and I, say they're a, a history teacher, first few years of teaching uh, history, and they think, right, okay, I'm entirely convinced uh, by Ben and Steve's argument here, what would what would you say uh, would be the first couple of steps to uh, that sort of teacher in order to um, kind of progress with getting classics on the curriculum? What would be the first two? Oh, there's, there's so many things you can do, but okay, in the interest of time, let's let's limit it. Um, if you've got more, that's fine. We've we got time. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I would advise you in, in the first instance to go to Advocating Classics Education website and look at the podcast there that uh, Edith Hall from King's London. I mean, King's London are just so lucky to have not just a great classicist like Edith there, but also someone who is such an advocate for classics in state schools. And she is passionate about introducing this into state schools. And also classics for all. Um, they have been doing this for so many years now that if you are a teacher in a school and you would just like to dip your toe in, but you don't know where to start, there are three things I would say. The first is go to those two organizations and they will definitely help you. The second is, if you want to dip your toe, why not teach at the start of year seven, instead of starting with the Normans or the Anglo-Saxons, why not start with seven lessons looking at ancient civilizations? Look at what ancient civilizations in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, look at what they had in common. Look at what human beings have done over the last 10,000 years and bring this together to, to interest children in the idea of history going back much, much, much further. And often in year seven, it's where history teachers introduce the idea of uh, a source, which is just something that people have left behind in, in the past, and evidence. And this idea of source and evidence, which history teachers try and teach thoroughly to children very early on in year seven, that can be done through the ancient world. The things that have been left behind, the sources, but then looking at what evidence do they give us. So a little example of that would be, uh, there's the, I think it's the first chapter of David Olasoga's book, um, Black and British, where he looks at the sources that the Romans left behind on Hadrian's wall that give us evidence that there were black Africans on Hadrian's wall. So it's, it's the furthest corners of this vast empire and they were stationed there uh, on Hadrian's Wall at the Western End, and it's very, it's very clear. Um, source and evidence. So if you're, if you're wanting to do it, why not introduce it early in year seven and just do a few lessons looking at the ancient world? And my third tip would be um, for GCSE, your take up for history will definitely increase if you offer ancient history. If you ask pupils, and just without any, uh, without any baggage or background, ask pupils whether they would like to study ancient history. And you will find that there were some pupils who would not opt for history if it wasn't ancient history. And then suddenly, as soon as you offer ancient history, you will get some children who would not otherwise have opted will then opt because it is the ancient world. You know, there's something about certain types of pupils that want to study the ancient world. And yet, if we're limiting it to year three and year four, as great as their experience can be, then I think we're doing some pupils a disservice because we could offer this. So don't let your unfamiliarity or your lack of confidence with this period of history um, hold you back from saying, actually, there are pupils who want to study this and we can definitely offer it to them.
Fantastic, thank you, Steve. And I will mirror that because in my in my current cohort of ancient history, um, even over lockdown, I've had kids sending me emails and going, "Well, sir, once I'm done with your GCSE course, I'm thoroughly interested in pursuing classical subjects onto college." And we live in an area where there actually aren't many colleges that offer it. But even so, uh, these kids are willing to find colleges that are perhaps a little bit more far flung to study these subjects because it the, the subject material is so engaging that they it's something they want to continue and something that they think about in their daily lives and it's, and it's something they speak about with their friends and so I would just absolutely mirror that enthusiasm that young people have for it as well because there is just so much scope to learn not just about like their own little sphere of influence in the world but like far-flung continents and times and cultures so I absolutely 100% agree with you there Steve. Um, I just want to say a big thank you for your time today. Um, I've run out of discussion questions and you've answered all of them inc incredibly well. I've thoroughly enjoyed our time together this morning. I just want to thank you again for your time and speaking to me today. Um, thank you very much. It's been an absolute all right. pleasure. Um, I do hope that I've managed to cover everything that you wanted to cover because I think when you get two ancient historians together, um, then go off topic quite easily. Well, maybe, you know, that maybe there's scope for an episode two at some point, Steve. That would be great. Wonderful. Are you on that? Uh, sorry, go on, Steve. I just said it's been wonderful speaking to you. Sorry, I was signing off there before you were ready. No, 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 it's all right. I was just wondering, I was just wondering if you were on Twitter. Um, yes, I am on Twitter. So, uh, Mastin, M-A-S-T-I-N, underscore, S for Steve, J-J-H, S-J-J-H. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Steve. And thank you again for discussing this with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Great. Thank you very much. Have a good day, Ben. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Really hope you enjoyed this recording. Before you go, please just do us one really quick favor and just click subscribe to our YouTube channel. We know it's a chore but it's gonna make such a huge difference to the network as we try to grow. Thank you.